The Lord bless you, brethren, beloved. Welcome to another Bible study. Um, we thank God for the break that we recently had, the holidays over the, what you call the Christmas period. It provided a break for many of us to meet up with family and brethren, friends, and just get some rest, refresh ourselves, and be back to the business of the Lord. And so I greet every one of us tonight in the wonderful name of Jesus. Welcome back to our first Bible study in 2023. And we are looking forward to sitting together and sharing together from the word of Almighty God. It is a good thing when we get together, amen, like this. And of course, this is still not the best of assembly, you know, being over the camera, being away from each other. But we will get there, God's willing. But for now, we will work with what we have. And so I welcome all of us, God's people, to Bible study. We are going to be going into a series um, at this start uh, for most of the year, as we go down into the year. Uh, you would have known, saints of God, that this year the theme, the broad team, theme for our church is earnestly contend. And when we talk about earnestly contend, we are talking about contending for the faith that was once delivered unto the saints. So we will be focusing a lot of our teaching, a lot of our Bible study around this central theme, earnestly contend. But for us to contend for things that make up this body of believers called the church, we want to step back for a while and re-examine and refocus our attention on the church, the church of Jesus Christ. And so the Bible study series that we are going to be looking at, that we are going to be uh, embarking on, is the church, and that is the subject area, amen, of Bible studies over the next few weeks. And we want to zoom in and we want to zero in and focus on the church. Who is the church? What is it about? And all the things associated with the church. And thereafter, as we start to expand and to roll out everything associated with the church, its doctrine, and we give some whys as to some of the things that would have been a part of the apostolic doctrine, the things that make up the church. It is going to certainly be a time of digging in and drilling in and having our eyes opened to some things. If, brothers and sisters, we are going to be going into the church, I believe we want to take it from the very beginning. We are going to be building from ground zero. In other words, from the inception, from bottom all the way up. And I want us to pay keen attention as we traverse this landscape, as we take this journey together into the church of our Lord Jesus Christ. I believe it is important that together we sit and we go through because we are living in a time, an age that the Bible spoke about. We can put things together and see and recognize that things are somewhat different from what many of us would have been accustomed to, what we became acclimatized to in our time in church. And we know that changes will come. Changes will happen in the society. Changes will happen in the different organizations and the different things that make up a society. But there are certain, what the Bible would call a particular age, uh, a particular era. And each age and 
era have some things characteristic about that particular period. And there is no doubt in my mind, saints of God, that we are in a time of great change, a time of, of upheavals. If you look around in our world, look around continent by continent, look around country by country, we will see some things that somehow it is common to every region. And I'm not talking about end time matter now, although that clearly is at play. But I'm just suggesting to us that we see a shift in years past, although you would normally have conflicts among nations. There was a time when the growth was just going. There was a time when even though we had recession, growth would come and folks would understand the things that ought to be done to restore stability in their respective economies and so forth. But we are coming to a particular point in history where every economist, every financial specialist, every head of government, uh, they are exclaiming that they somehow are at a loss to project what the next move should be. Many of them have openly admitted that they are confused and they, while they have the background and the training and the experience in matters economic, in matters financial, in matters political, it is at a point in the broad, wider society that they are just unable to give large-scale futuristic projections. Things are happening that they have never seen before. Things are happening uh, geopolitically that they have never read about and in their studies it was not contemplated. So in the material secular world, clearly there is a shift and the era is such that heads of government and folks who we would look to for leadership, they are at a loss as to what is happening. In the realm of the spirit, the very same things are happening. If you go to those, and I'm not even talking about Christianity now, look at other religious groups, and there seem to be turmoil in these groups uh, to the extent that one religious group has, has made the call for all religions to come together, put aside and don't discuss and disclose the things that we have in common. And let us see if we can work out the differences because for the first time, it seems in religious circles that uh, things are such that let us just work together and try to come to some common position. In the church, upheavals are taking place also. Things that were once sacrosanct, things that we once held dearly, things that uh, would have been a normal part of the Christian walk and the Christian trajectory is being thrown aside. And it's not happening now. It has been happening for quite a while. And it continues and it has somehow reached to a critical juncture that even folks today are wondering if the church is really real and if God is really real and if the church is just another organization or religious body. They have lost touch with reality and they have lost touch with the things that are written in the book called the Bible. And so they have made the comparisons. They have looked at the Bible and they have looked at what is happening in many church organizations and church assemblies today and are wondering if this thing is really what we have made it out to be. But I, I believe it is important at this point in history that we draw back and we go back to foundation. We go back to the fundamentals. We go back to the genesis of things so that we can look again 
and we can reconfirm, confirm and reconfirm that this body called the church, it has gone through a whole lot of things in the past. It is going through stuff now. It will continue to go through stuff. But I want to reassure those that are steadfast and that are confident in the word of Almighty God and that you're a part of the church. I would like to confirm in your earring and in your hearts and minds that there will always be a church until Jesus comes again. This living organism is real. As I said, living, it is alive and it is well. And in spite of what is happening in the church right across the globe, in spite of the things that folks in the secular environment will throw at the church to say that it is irrelevant, to say that it has no place in this postmodern era. I want to assure the hearts of the people of God that this thing is real and we are on the right track. And I want to encourage us to allow for our anchor to hold. The adversary is at work. And he's doing everything to pull down and to tear down and to pluck up and to plow up and to cause a kind of a smokescreen in things that pertain to God and the church and everything that Jesus Christ stood for. It is a trick of the enemy. It is a deception. And I want the church to know that we will call out the things that are deceptive and is seeking to pull down that which God established. And so we are going to go on a journey from the Bible, chapter and verse, and re-examine and look at the church and the priorities and the doctrines and the things that we hold. And I want us to take the time that, to understand that what we are in the faith that we have and that we are holding on to is a most holy faith. And we will quote from the book of Jude, amen, where the prophet outlined some things and reminded us that this is our most holy faith and we must hold on to it. The adversary is working over time in Jamaica, in the Caribbean, in North America, continent by continent he's trying to do everything to spite god and he's going to go out of his way to bring down the church this holy body this body of believers he's going to dissuade you from holding on to jesus he's going to tell you that what you have is not real he's going to tell you that it is something that was trumped up he's going to cause you to ponder your relationship with God, wondering even if God is real. This is the age that we are in. And so we are going to take our time and we are going to go through and we are going to examine the church triumphant and we are going to establish at the end that this thing is authentic. This thing is the real deal and this is the vehicle that God Almighty has chosen to carry us safely from this life to the eternal things that he has promised. If you are not in the church, you will not make it into the great beyond. If you have not come by way of the door of Jesus Christ, you are going to miss. You are going to be out of all that is prepared for the future and for the eternal state. If you are going to make it, if you are going to be alive, if you are going to be in eternity with God, we have got to come by way of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. I pity those who are in the church and talk derogatory of the church. This institution was set up by our Lord Jesus Christ. And irrespective of how you see it, 
Be careful how we kick against the pricks. One individual tried to do some things to destabilize and to tear down the church because he had no knowledge that it was set up by Almighty God and it cannot be destroyed. It cannot be wiped out. It cannot be weakened. And he learned the hard way. And so I pity those who point a finger at the church. I pity those from within and from without who say that the church is irrelevant and the church is nothing and the church is a place of hurt and the church only mess people up. My God, those are thoughts injected into the minds of many coming straight from hell, straight from the devil. But I want to challenge the people of God. Wherever we stand, let us move to make it right with God, make it right in our hearts, make it right in our minds so that we can appreciate and understand what we are a part of and move to put our houses in order. It is almost time for the Lord to come. No. I started out by saying that we are going to take this thing from ground zero. We are going to be looking at the church and we are going to be building from zero, ground zero and going all the way up. Now, most folks would be surprised to know that what we are a part of today and this body that you and I are in called the church even though we know the time when it was initiated in about AD 33, thereabout, on the day of Pentecost, we know the story well. We know what Jesus did prior to Pentecost, that he died on the cross and that he made the promise that the Holy Ghost was going to come. Another comforter will come who will abide with you forever. And we know how the Bible outlined and described it. Then we know the story in the book of Acts, how Jesus, before he was taken up, uh, outlined to them and said to the disciples and about 120 that were gathered, he said, look here now, I want you to move and for, for you to go over to a particular place, the upper room, and I want you to tarry there, to stay there until you be endued with power from an Hi. He started to talk to them and he was going through everything and rehearsing what had happened throughout his lifetime and what he had told them was going to happen and indicated to them that I told you I was going to die and I was going to raise again. And indeed he did. And he's now saying something big is going to happen, but I want you to wait. So listen to me, go over into the upper room and stay there until you be endured with power from on high. Earlier, he had given the keys to the kingdom to the apostle Peter, yes? And he told him that I'm giving you the keys to the kingdom. And so whatsoever you bind on earth is going to be bound in heaven and whatsoever you loose on earth is going to be loose in heaven. But he did say to you, Peter, I give the keys to the kingdom. And so he was taken out of their sight and he went off to another place and the disciples moved to follow through on what Jesus had commanded them to do. And so they went to that upper room and they tarried there for a period of time, about 120 of them, all the apostles, including Mary, the mother of Jesus, and the other Marys, and everybody, about 120 in number. And the Bible said, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, and it goes on to outline what was happening, you know, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire. And they were filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Brothers and sisters, from there they came and they went out to the outside. And they started to manifest and they started to preach 
and they started to declare the word of Almighty God. Peter stood up and he started to preach the word of God. And at the end or somewhere towards the end of his sermon, people started to ask the question, what shall we do? What must we do? And Peter stood up. This is the day of Pentecost. This is where it all happened. This is how it all started in terms of the actual manifestation and startup of the church. And Peter preached the first gospel message and the message of the kingdom. And then he instructed the people whose hearts were pricked what they were supposed to do. Repent, he said, and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So the gospel message of repentance, which is death to sin. And, and then after repentance, he told them that you are to go down in water in the name of Jesus Christ. And then he went on to say you will receive the infilling of the Holy Ghost. I want us brothers and sisters to know that this gospel message and this plan of salvation that the apostle Peter reeled out to the people and which took them into this body of believers called the church even though it was happening right there in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost about AD 33 I would like for us to understand that this church was in the mind of God and in the plan of God long before A.D. 33 on the day of Pentecost. So that if we are going to get into the heart and drill down in our study of the church, the church of Jesus Christ, then we are going to have to go back in time before the apostle Peter preached that message before they were in the upper room and they were filled with the Holy Ghost. We are going to have to go back even before Jesus hung on that cross and shed his blood to purchase our salvation. We are going to, we are going to have to go back before that to look at the genesis of the church that was in the mind of God. And which he started to roll out to his people from the moment they came out of Egyptian bondage. Most folks would have no concept of the church being outlined in the Old Testament. Most Christians are unaware of what happened in Exodus after the departure from Egypt and after moving through the wilderness, they would be at a total loss to learn that the church was being foreshadowed. The church that you and I are a part of today was prefigured in scriptures in the Old Testament. And we are going to go right back to that so that we can build from there and we can understand that the church is not something that was just pulled out of nowhere. It is not a new thing that came about because the Jews rejected Jesus and therefore God would have dealt a different way. But because of the rejection of the Jews, God decided that he was going to form a church and go to the Gentiles. And so it's just a new thing. And therefore, there are some folks who believe that because the church is different from what happened in the Old Testament, it has nothing to do with the law and it is just a brand new thing and we therefore have our freedom in the church to do anything we want as we worship God. I would like us, which we are going to do, to go back to see that this that you and I are in, that we are a part of, was prefigured in the Old Testament. It was planned it was in the mind of God and God showed us something back there in types so that when the real thing came, we will know how to operate within the church. We would know the kind of mindset to move about within the church with. There are folks who teach and who believe that we just 
once we have a particular mind to worship God, that is all that is required. Worship God the way that suits us best. God is only interested in worship. But I would like us to know, brothers and sisters, that God is interested in us worshiping him. But he goes deeper than that. It is not just to worship God our way, but it is to worship God his way. And we are going to find that in the church, God has a particular design. If we are going to worship him, if we are going to live for him, if we are going to be holy, if we are going to be right standing people, God has established a way for us to navigate within the church. And if we don't understand from the ground up, we might be in the thing and we miss a whole lot. There are folks in the church today who have missed the whole solemnness, the whole matter of separation and holiness, the somber mood that we must carry and the way in which we must treat this salvation that we have in a most holy way. We have lost, we have lost sight of how precious what we have is. We have lost sight of the fact that God wants us to be separate for himself. There are two forces, brothers and sisters, at work in our world today. We all know that. We have heard that from time to time. There is the good that is led by Almighty God and there is a bad and evil force that is led by Satan who got threw out, kicked out of heaven because of his rebellion. And so in our world today, there are two systems that are diametrically opposed to each other. And they are at work. We are either going to be on one side in one camp or on the other side in another camp. But there are folks that are trying to straddle the two camps. It cannot work. And we are going to see as we go back to the Genesis where the church was prefigured. We are going to see that God was showing us some things that would have formed a part of everything that he was doing coming down the line. We are going to look back at the tabernacle in the wilderness because that is where it all began. You would know by now that God, when he led the children of Israel out of Egypt and guided them to the promised land, when they reached into that wilderness, God indicated that he wanted to dwell among them. And it happened by way of the tabernacle that was set up in the wilderness. It was God's way of coming down and having a physical, if we may use that term, because the Ark of the Covenant was a physical uh, furniture, the tent with all of the associated things was a physical thing. And just as people were physical, God wanted not to be distant and to be in the heavens using uh, the clothes and pillars of fire by night to lead them. He wanted to be right in their midst. And so he instructed, he gave instructions to Moses for some things that he had in mind and for Moses to do. He was about to do a new thing in his quest to dwell among men. But what he was going to do was going to have eternal impact Applications. It was going to be something that he set out, but while it was there, it had another meaning. And the other meaning that was behind it was more real than the actual tabernacle that was there with the people in the wilderness. So the tabernacle had a meaning. It represented and it symbolized some things which were to come. It is important, brothers and sisters, that we understand that. It is important that we understand every step of the way what was symbolized in the tabernacle that was set up from way back there in the wilderness. And so as we drill into that, we will get to know, to learn a lot, and to know that the church that we are seeing today 
came out of the bowels of Almighty God. It came out of what he started out with, with the tabernacle or the sanctuary, then the temple when Solomon built it, all the way down to what we have today. And we are going to trace the steps so that we can understand that the church is not a singular body that just came out of nowhere because of some things not going right. But the church is a part of an entire whole that started in Genesis with the tabernacle. And that tabernacle prefigured the church that was come so that what we are seeing today is the real life image of what was being projected from back there. You know, if you have a shadow, you have to have a real body that shows the shadow, right? So if the shadow was the tabernacle, if the tabernacle was the type, then what was the real thing that caused that shadow to be cast? The real image, the real thing was nothing more than this living church that we are in today. God was giving us an example. God was teaching us some things through the tabernacle. And it behoves all of us, brothers and sisters, to step back, to take a little time, and to look into the tabernacle. We will learn a whole lot of things. And so we are here today. We are in the church. And let me tell you something about the church. And I'm giving us this background so that we can have a good understanding as to why we are going back to the tabernacle to get the full understanding of the church. And it is important because the lessons that will come out of that, when we map ourselves against those lessons, we can see and will see if we are on target or if we have missed the mark. We are going to see if our lives are in keeping with what God intended because he made it clear with the shadow. And if the shadow required certain things and showed certain things, just imagine what the real thing will require of us. Which real thing we are in today. Jesus said something that was very significant in the book of St. Matthew. He was speaking about the Sadducees and the Pharisees. And he made a very significant point. You remember when he was on the Mount of Olives and he was going through dealing with the Beatitudes in the book of St. Matthew. He was talking about blessed are the poor and blessed are the meek. And he was giving us something. As we went through, as we go through that discourse with Jesus, we find him saying something. He said, it is said, thou shalt not commit adultery. That is written in Old Testament scriptures that came out of the law, that came under the dispensation of the law. And those tablets that had the Ten Commandments were placed in that box that went about with Israel. That box that had the cherubims folding their wings on it. That box in which the very presence of Almighty God resided right between the folding of the cherubim wings and the cover of that Ark of the Covenant, that box that is called the Ark of the Covenant. And in it, the tablet of stone that he wrote. And one of the things that he wrote, you shall not commit adultery. And so that was there under the tabernacle, under that period. But did you know that coming over into this era that we are in, into this church and into this church age, Jesus was now saying, it, was, it is written, thou shalt not commit adultery. But he is now saying that in this dispensation, in this era, I say unto you, if you in your mind think 
and lust with the person in your mind, you have already committed adultery. So that whereas in the Old Testament, under the law, written on those stones, that was in the tabernacle, that was a type. And if you lie with the person who was not your wife, you committed adultery. Jesus is now saying, in this era in which the church is in, which is the real thing, not the tabernacle, not the shadow, the real thing, he's saying here, it is not just to go lie with her that would have made you commit adultery. Just lusting after her in your mind, you have already committed the act. We are held to a higher standard in the church than was in the tabernacle. But of course, because the tabernacle was a type. So we are going to learn some things, brothers and sisters, from the type. What was prefigured. We are going to see how God operated. We are going to see the fear and the degree of holiness that the people moved about with who had to do with the sanctuary. We are going to see or the tabernacle. We are going to see that it didn't stop them from being happy people and enjoying themselves, amen, in the Lord. But we are going to see that it allowed them and required of them to be separate from all the other Gentile nations around and they could be happy and resourceful in the space that they had, that God had given to them. And they could do all of that and yet still maintain a sense of fear for God and a sense of holiness and separation and do the will of God and yet be happy people. And so it is important. So the Bible tells us in St. Matthew, and we could probably just look at it together, St. Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18, uh, the Bible literally tells us, and I say unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. It is a fact. The gates of hell will not prevail against it. It is a fact that no matter what anybody do, the church is going to stand. But I want to make the point that this church is much deeper than many people make it out to be. This church is much, much deeper. I mentioned it just now. If we observe the treatment of the early church fathers and how they describe what they have, how they have taken their Holy Ghost experience, how they walk with God. If you look at their writings and how they uh, conveyed things in the church to those that they had responsibility for, you would see the godly fear that was there in their hearts as they, they walked about and as they talked and as they wrote, the godly fear. You will see that fear fell upon the church. When you look at the writings of the Apostle Paul and some of the other, other apostles and they give their word of, of chastisement and advice and encouragement, fear fell upon the people. It's not that they feared Paul, but they feared God. And it is important for us to understand that the Apostle Jude, in Jude verses 20 and 21, says, tells us something. He said, but, but you... Beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. And he went on, and he went on saying, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life so he's telling them and admonishing them to build themselves on their most holy faith when you listen to the writings of these men as they convey their heart and convey their thoughts you will realize that it all had to do with them being holy with them being righteous with them living a particular way it had to do with them understanding that what they have is a powerful thing, is a real thing. You cannot trivialize. You cannot trample sacred things. It is very important for us to understand that. Now, there is a scripture, 
and I just want to veer off for a quick moment. And all that I'm doing is establishing the background because I want when we get into the tabernacle scenes of God and we start to do the comparisons, we are able to, to match it and to map it and to see clearly what I'm saying. But I'm saying to us, many today have trivialized what they have. Many today have taken for granted. They have trampled. They have treated lightly things pertaining to God. Yes, they are in the church, but they do very little in the church of God. They give very little. They pray very little. They fast very little. And everything here, it is as if this is their secondary activity. Their, what is on the forefront is what they do for themselves. What is on the forefront is what I accomplish in terms of my career at work. What, I, what is at the forefront is what I achieve in business. So that if you look at the lives of many, we can easily see that the church plays a secondary role in their lives. And this is absolutely wrong. As I say this and then make the point that we are going to see that the tabernacle in the wilderness was at the center of everything that the people of God then had to do. It was at the center. In other words, the tabernacle was set up with everything associated with it. The tent where you had the holy place and the most holy place. It was set up along with the outer court at a particular place. And then, that being set up, the tribes were gathered. They gathered themselves around this central figure called the tabernacle with the outer court, everything. So that a set of tribes were north. A set of the tribes were south. A set of the tribes were east. And a set of the tribes were west. And so they were all gathered north, south, east, and west. And at the center of it, brothers and sisters, hear what I'm saying. At the center of the layout of the people was the tabernacle where God's presence resided by way of the Ark of the Covenant. He was at the center of everything that happened in the life of Israel. It is important for us to see that and understand the concept. Those of us who make the church a secondary part of our lives, we have better stop, take note, and fix that. The church, and you might think church is just about people and say, I can't deal with the church and I can't deal with the church people and the church want to get into my life and the church want to dictate that I do this and the church and the church and the church. To the extent that those some people that are saved talk about the church like how unsaved talk about the church, like it is a burden. And I want to take this time to warn some children of God who have made the church a mockery and have trivialized what God has as the heart and the apple of his eyes. I want to take this time to warn some of you to desist and set your houses in order because we have lost our way to the point that some of us mock the church. You're in the church and you're mocking the church. But any saint that is mocking the church, you better understand that you're kicking against the pricks. Draw back, look at yourself, and don't be led astray by misinformed people. And don't make anybody misinform you. And don't be misguided. There are some folks, you run all over the place. They run everywhere, and they don't even know what to believe. Settle down. Focus. Sit down at the table and eat at your home. So that you can be properly fed and you can understand what is happening and make, just like in the old, the ark, the tabernacle, the sanctuary was right 
at the center, front and center, and everything else revolved around it, let us make sure that we have the church and the Lord Jesus Christ who is at the heart of the church because it is his church. It is the church of Jesus Christ. It is not Brother Daly Church. It is not Brother William's church. It is the church of Jesus Christ. And we need to understand that and get back to the proper concept of what the church is. And so I admonish and warn some, lest you find that you run into problems with the Lord Jesus Christ. I say this because I do not want us to trivialize and to trample sacred things. Sometimes it is necessary, children of God, to restate these things. New people come and some would have waned and so forth. But I want us to get back together and to understand who we are and whose we are and to understand that we cannot and we must not trample on spiritual things. We have been given God's best. Do not settle for less. Do not let and allow uncircumcised Philistines to dictate to you what is right and what is wrong. Allow the word of God to open in your heart and in your life. To open itself in our minds and in our hearts. And I pray and urge and admonish all of us to walk in the things that are clearly outlined in the word. The word is everything. If you love me, keep my words. And so it is easy for us as men to, you know, drift to the side of the rail and to, you know, derail sometimes. But then I do have a responsibility to present to us and to get us back on track. And it is important. The Bible tells us in 1 Kings, and we can read it together, 1 Kings chapter number 10 verses 16 to 17, it tells us something and I want us to take a little time out to see exactly what is happening here. It brings home a point and it's clear that what happened, that there was a, a swapping that took place. Yes, there was a, a, a swapping, an exchange. Right? It, 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 it is just so clear in our eyes. And here is what the scripture says, 1 Kings chapter 10, verses 16 and 17. And King Solomon, this was Solomon who God had blessed tremendously. God had blessed him tremendously. And this Solomon, he had everything, excuse me, he had everything, every blessing from above. Yes, his kingdom was elevated. At the time he was walking right with God. God allowed him through a dream to uh, ask whatever he wanted from God. What a thing to present to a man. And the man could have asked anything according to God. He could have asked for the life of his enemies. He could have asked, you know, for riches. And Solomon asked that God give him wisdom to deal with this great people, which was God's people. And the Bible said God was so pleased with the request that that king made, that God gave him not only his request, but a whole lot more was added on to him. His kingdom was renowned. His wealth was untold. The, the, his kingdom in terms of his staff and the people that were there, everything that Solomon did, he was just elevated by God. And so he was just glowing and flowing and moving with Almighty God. And the verse here tells us, And King Solomon made 200 targets of beaten gold, 600 shekels of gold went to one target. Then now it goes on to verse 17, And he made 300 shields of beaten gold, three pound of gold went into one shield and the king put them in the house 
of the forest of Lebanon. What the scripture is trying to describe to us is that Solomon was wealthy. Solomon was affluent because of the blessings of Almighty God to the extent that he could make shields out of gold. He could make shields for his guardsmen, for his warriors out of gold and then he kept them at his home in Le the forest of Lebanon. He had a house where he would keep them. And whenever time King Solomon was moving to go down to offer with the priests at the house of the Lord, those men took up those shields and they stood before and it was a great, just imagine the pomp and the pageantry as King Solomon moved over to the house of the Lord with those guards carrying in front of them shields made out of gold. That was a display of affluence and power and just God's blessing upon this particular man who God delighted with at the time. And so 300 shields of beaten gold and that was what was there now i want us to look to another scripture this is the same first kings but this time i want us to jump to ver to chapter 14 and i want us to see something happening here there was a change there was something that was different by this time uh rehoboam the son of king solomon was now reigning so this was years after. The same thing was about to happen. Uh, King Rehoboam was going to move from the palace and walk over to the temple to offer with the priest and do what he had to do in terms of working in the house of the Lord. Of course, the same guards would have been coming and they would have taken up the shield and they would have walked across with him and look at the pomp and pageantry. And I put that in quotation as they marched across. But I want us to notice something here this time round. Notice what happened with King Solomon as he went. God was with him. The presence of God was there. And he was able to march, have his guards marching with him around with shields made of gold. And they marched across to the temple and it was a sight to behold. But look at what is happening here a couple years later with Rehoboam in 1 Kings chapter 14 and we start at verse 26. And he took away the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king's house. He even took away all. And he took away all the shields of gold which Solomon had made. And let me just quickly, let me just quickly relate to you what happened here. While... Solomon was doing what he was doing, and we just said he built those shields of gold. Some things happened. The kingdom started to decline. Things that they held sacrosanct, they started to reject. At the time that Solomon was there, they all, all knew that they had to go to the temple to allow the priests the high priest to offer sacrifice to God. They knew that everything that happened within the temple confines were things that were of utmost importance. They knew that they had to give of their offering so that the priest could take it to the Lord. They knew that there was no other God to be served and therefore Jehovah God was the only God. They knew that there was no other altar and everybody had to take time to come down to Jerusalem to offer on behalf of their family and to give God glory and praise and worship. They knew what was required. They knew what was there. It was sacrosanct. But after a while, it began to decline. It started in the heart of Solomon. It, it started in the hearts of the people. After a while, guess what was happening? They built groves on the hillsides and they started to offer sacrifice to strange gods. 
on, in these groves. They built altars over here, altars over there. And so the focus that was supposed to have been centered around the temple in Jerusalem, the focus was now shifted. This man was focusing on this, that man was focusing on that, and therefore the temple was no longer the center of their lives. It did not hold a central place in their lives. And so, little by little, things began to eat away at what was once sacrosanct in their lives to the point where God departed from them. And as a result of that departure, they settled for less than what used to be there. They settled for less and they became comfortable with mediocrity. They became comfortable with inferior experiences. Instead of trying to serve God and get back to what they knew was right and build themselves back up and allow God to come again and strengthen them and bless them and cause them to be overcomers where their enemies were concerned. They rather hold on to the mediocre experience so that they could continue in their way and offer sacrifice in the hills, in the groves, in every nook and cranny and forsake the things that they knew was right. If we are not careful, there is a tendency in man to become satisfied with little so long as they can do what they want to do. So they have a part of the experience, even though it's mediocre, but they have what they want over here. I submit to you that I said it before and I say it again. The kingdom of light and the kingdom of darkness cannot commingle. There has to be a separation. There has to be a difference. And they allow that commingling to take place back there. And look now what 1 Kings chapter 14 and verse 27 says. And this is the part that I want us to use the scripture and bring out. And King Rehoboam, after the king of Egypt came and took away, because God had now moved away from them, and had now moved the hedge, and therefore they were unable to defend themselves. And the king of Egypt came down to them at that time and ransacked the place. Yes? And took away all the shields of gold that King Solomon had made. And so this is where we are now in verse 27. And King Rehoboam made in their stead brazen shield. In other words, he made the shield now. But they were of brass and committed them into the hands of the chief of the guard. The very thing that Solomon did, Rehoboam is now doing it years later. But whereas Solomon at the time when he was walking with God and following the precepts and living by them, God blessed them and God was with them. And Solomon was able to make shields of gold signifying something serious. No, they did everything that they wanted to do years later. Walk away from this. This is no longer applicable. They don't have to go to Jerusalem to worship. They don't have to go to the temple. We can build an altar in the hills. We can, and they did what was convenient to them. But notice, they still maintained relationship with the temple and with the priests. And the king now had to know that the king of Egypt took away the shields of gold. He now made them over, but he did not have what was there before because God had left. He did not have the experience that his father had when he was in his head here walking with God. God was not there. It had watered down. It had disintegrated. It had evaporated. 
and they had to now use inferior metals because gold was no longer there. Not even silver in sufficient quantity to build a shield. They had to use inferior material to make shields to hand to the chief of the guard and they used brass. This is how the thing degenerated. This is how the thing went down. So they placed into the hands of the chief of the guards which kept the door of the king's house. Brothers and sisters, shields of brass for shield of gold. Inferior, watered down, mediocre. And the people were willing to settle for that so that they could still offer their sacrifice in the groves and in the hills. Well, I say to us, Church of the Living God, take from this lesson, take from what has happened here, and understand that we must not and we cannot settle for inferior experiences and inferior things and mediocrity in the house of God. And hence the reason we are going to go back to the basics and the beginning from the time that it was in the mind of God and he placed it out and called Moses up into the mountain and gave him a pattern that he should build some things and follow it to the T. We are going to find that God told Moses, follow the pattern. Exactly. Don't deviate from what I tell you. And we're going to see God over and over again saying to Moses as he was building that thing, remember, do it as I said. As we go through, we are going to see it. And we are going to find out that no matter what we think and no matter how we put it, some things cannot change. Some things are just directly from the word of Almighty God. And the pattern is there. And we are going to look at the pattern. We are going to look at the type and we are going to look at the reality. And we are going to look at the word that was there then and the word that is here now. And we are going to find that a whole lot of folks are misguided. Teachers with itching ears. In other words, teachers telling them what they want to hear and it soothes their own flesh and what it is that they want and they are happy with that. But brothers and sisters, if it is not conforming with the word, be careful the things that you hear. All kind of things are being banded about today. This is the age of information and Satan has used men dressed up like this. He has used women that call themselves prophetess and they use the word and they twist it and they turn it and they change it and they do all kinds of things with it and it appeals to the flesh. It makes us comfortable and at a place where we want to be. I can serve God. Oh, I want to serve him. And not realizing that you can't serve God. Oh, you want to serve him. I can't serve God. Oh, I want to serve him. But we must serve him the way that he instructs us to serve him. And it is in the word. So we are going to take our time and we are going to go through. I would like us to quickly, two little scriptures, and then we jump into some things. Two little scriptures from the New Testament, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4, and you know, pardon me, you know, I'm taking time and I'm going slowly, I want the scriptures to seep in, I want us to understand it is on my heart, and I will not make any bones about using the scriptures, and, and it must soothe or it must hurt, but whichever way we take it, let it soothe or let it hurt, it is the word of God. And there will be no compromise with basic things, with fundamental things as it relates to the tabernacle, to the church. It is the word of God that determines what is done, how we move, and what is required. And hence, our look again at the church, very important. So 2 Timothy chapter number 4, let us read it together, verses 2 to 4. Preach the word. And I am admonishing all of our leaders and every saint of God. Don't be afraid. Talk to your co-worker. Talk to your neighbor. You need to know who you are. You need to know what you have. 
You're separate, you're different, you're not of the world. You're in the world, but you're not of the world. You're bought with a price. You are different. Know your identity. It is very important. And so, Paul talking to Timothy, outlining some things to him, very important. He said, listen to me now. Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. What this is saying is that what this is saying is that they, because of what is good to them, what is comfortable to them, what is convenient to them. They want a word to synchronize with their convenience so that they can be comfortable in two places. But I'm submitting to you, be very careful. It's not going to be like that. There's a lot of televangelists around that they, they, they have just somehow specialize in presenting to us words that we want to hear, words that will make us come back to their channel, words that will make us want to give them the, the clicks and all the things that they want so that they can be and get what they're after. But I'm saying to us, be very careful, children of God. The time will come, and I believe the timing is here, when they will not endure sound doctrine, because sound doctrine sometimes is hard. But we are called to sacrifice as members of the church, as people of God, as born again believers. Remember that it is not about me, it is about him. And so when we are called to sacrifice, I have, I have learned, I have learned, and I've heard in recent times, the Bible has taught us about fasting and prayer, you know. And the Bible teaches us what fasting is. You know, to abstain from food. Yes, to abstain and no eating. God in dealing with Moses took him up and 40 days and 40 nights, nothing came to his mouth. Jesus, when he was here, was in the wilderness fasting. He had gone 40 days and 40 nights, nothing that afterwards. The Bible said when he was finished, he was afterwards and hungered. That means him hungry. It meant he didn't eat, he didn't drink. 40 days, 40 nights, when it was Elijah, same thing happened. Paul, the apostle, after he had his experience and he was knocked off for three days, he was in fasting, had nothing to eat. We know from Bible, going into the book of Isaiah and looking at what the whole issue and concept of fasting is, it is abstaining from food, the very thing that would keep us alive. We are willing to put that aside so that we can engage with God and draw nigh to the presence of Almighty God. Bring this flesh under subjection and draw nigh to God. Yet, with that clear understanding of fasting, you have Christians today that says we have misunderstood fasting means simply to abstain. And so we can go on a 21 day of fasting and what we fast is that we abstain from reading the gleaner every day. Because gleaner is a part of our daily activity and every day we read the gleaner. And so we can go on fasting and it is just as effective to not read the gleaner for 21 days as it is effective to abstain from food for 21 days. That's a lie. That's people bringing up things to make it convenient to their flesh. And they say, I was on 21 days of fasting. And guess, all they fasted from, fasted is to abstain from reading a paper. And you're going to get the blessing from, or you're always reading a book. And so for the next 21 days, I am not going to read that book. And I'm going to take that time to go before the presence of God. And you consider that fasting. That is folks that easily have put aside sound doctrine. 
fasting for them and the doctrine of fasting where Jesus said, look here, the time is going to come. While he was there, the bridegroom was here. He said, you don't fast when the bridegroom is here, but the time is going to come when you will fast. And they were talking about the other disciples who fast, they don't eat, and they make up them face because they're hungry anymore. Everybody know that they're fasting. Fasting was abstinence from eating and drinking. Fasting is abstinence from food. That is the basic things. People now put aside sound doctrine and come with these new things. Oh, we're going to fast from reading the Gleaner and have 21 days of that. And you're going to get the same blessing that in terms of mortifying this body that you would have gotten as you, when you abstain from food. It is absolutely wrong. They say there is no need to damage your flesh and don't eat for four days and three days and five days. That is nonsense. This is church people talking. This is what is happening in many churches and they have it on the ear and, oh, you are crazy fanatics. How can you have somebody don't eat nothing for seven days? How can you don't have somebody eat anything for three days? You're a cult. And folks in the church, because they are so unstable and they go to every table to eat. They are messed up in their minds and they come back saying that, you know, we don't have to fast. Yes, we have to. And if you're a part of the church of Jesus Christ, we will fast. We will abstain from food. We will abstain from drink. No pleasant food, no pleasant drink. And we will fast the Bible way. We're not going to just say we're not going to wear a certain color because we are used to pushing on all kind of thing. We just go wear black for 21 days and that is our fast and that is good as not eating anything. No, it is not. And so the scripture tells us and let's us just focus on that. On it again. Second Timothy. I want that to seep in and mark you. I'm going through, you know, and we're going to take with time and get to the real deal as it relates to the tabernacle. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned on. To fables. Brothers and sisters, we need to be very careful. We need to understand ourselves. We need to know who we are and we will abide by the word of God. It is what God requires. Yes? Matthew chapter 7 and verse 5. And I'm going to stop the scripture so that we can go over into something uh, quickly. Matthew chapter 7 and verse 15. Matthew 7 and verse 15. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Brothers and sisters, these are warnings. The apostles knew what was going to happen. The disciples knew what was going to happen. The day was going to come when we hear some things that are happening, when we hear some things that are being said, when we hear some things that are being put forth in the church today. And I'm not just talking about the church because we know, and I'm not hitting at anybody in terms of your denomination, and I'm, I'm not even getting there. I am simply saying to us right now, there are churches, there are folks that call themselves churches that would tell us that Mary is a, um, our mediator, and they tell us a whole lot of stuff. They tell us that we can recite certain things and what God and this and God that. If we hear some things, we cringe for the things that we hear amongst people that say that they are a part of the body of Christ. There are folks that tell us some things that you can go here and they pray for you and you're transferred from hell to paradise and all kind of lies and they use the Bible and so Matthew is saying beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep clothing but inwardly they are ravening wolves brethren beloved be careful brethren beloved be careful brethren beloved I say to us again be careful the apostle Peter in 2nd Peter 2 and verse 1, uh, recited again, and I'm just giving us the scriptures, and I want us to understand because there is an attack on the church of Jesus Christ. The, the adversary 
is at work, the adversary is going over time, the adversary is doing what he has to do. That is his job. But then we too, saints of God, must be aware of his wiles and we must sharpen up ourselves and we have got to understand who we are and walk in the word. But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that brought them and bring upon themselves a swift destruction. There are folks even in church, what I use quotation mark as I say church, because they're saying that Jesus was a great teacher, but nothing more, and denying the only Lord God and our Savior Jesus Christ. There are folks that are in institutions that they call themselves church. They are saying it is not important to be baptized and you don't have to be baptized. All of these things were foreign to the apostolic church. But now even in some groups that say they are apostolic, they are telling us that no, you don't need to be baptized again. No, you don't need to be baptized in Jesus' name. No, the Holy Ghost is not important. No, 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 you don't need to do this. No, no, and everything that was once a part of sound doctrine is now being threatened. And I stand tonight and I oppose and I stand against every single one of those false teachings and we are going to go through this and we are going to take it from the first rung of the step and we are going to come all the way up and we are going to reject and use the scriptures and reject every one of those damnary, damnable heresies we are going to use the scriptures and we are going to call out what is false and we are going to present and we are going to present and to all these purveyors of doctrines that are not in the Bible, we are going to call them out and we are going to use scriptures and we are going to show and we are going to use the scriptures and we are going to strengthen the brethren and we are going to strengthen the church of the Lord Jesus Christ and every attack from the adversary, we are going to stand up against it. And that is a fact. There's a scripture in 1 Peter, 1 Peter 1 and verse 23. And I think I will close off that sec this section with that scripture. 1 Peter uh, 1 and verse 23. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. Brethren, beloved, as we go through these studies, we are going to affirm and reaffirm the words of Almighty God. We are going to make them connect. We are going to show them to you. We are going to present them, take it or leave it. But it is the word. It is sound doctrine, line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. We are going to take our time and we are going to go through with these things. So, Pardon me if I sound a little bit um, rough, but we are in for a rough ride. We are in for a tumultuous ride. But understand me, I'm not going to be hitting any individual groups, any particular church organization or denom. No, we're not, we're not going to do that. It, we're just going to do the things straight. We're just going to look at the word. It will have its impact on others. But I'm just putting on a blinker and I'm just going into the word. And I want us to look at the word as it is. We are not, and I'm not going to purport to, to be a know-it-all. Right? And we will never be dogmatic on everything. Because there are some things, no matter how we try to put some things together, there are some things that, based on how it is structured in scriptures, it, it leaves a door for pursuing it along a particular school of thought. So we understand certain things. But then there are other things that are so fundamental, fundamental to the core of what God would have us to have for 
our salvation. It is fundamental to our walk with God. It is fundamental to our relationship with God. It is fundamental to us making it into the new Jerusalem and into the eternal life beyond. And once something is fundamental to that extent, there must be no compromise. And we, we have to do what we have to do and we have to present it. And this is why I said, no, we're going from the back and we're going to take it up and we are going to look through the tabernacle and we are going to see what is there. So let me just start now by making a point about the tabernacle. In that tabernacle, there are answers to some of the misconceptions that are around. In the tabernacle, we will find that solutions to things that we don't understand, solutions to questions that is in our minds, questions that may come and we don't have the answer for, we find that when we go to the sanctuary, when we go to the tabernacle, we find that the answers emerge. There is something about the tabernacle that because we just didn't know how important it was in the scheme of things, we trivially glossed over. And whereas we're not going to do an in-depth study of the tabernacle because that is a deep study and long and it's so much to learn. But we are going to extract some things from the tabernacle so that we can see where the church is and how the church was prefigured in the tabernacle. And we are going to show that the tabernacle all the way down to the church was one plan of almighty God being unfolded and we are today in the part of the plan that is called the church. We are going to see some things. We are going to realize that this thing is just as sacred as the tabernacle back there. We are going to see that this thing is just as sacred as the body tabernacle of the Lord Jesus Christ, the body of Jesus Christ himself, who was typified in the tabernacle, his body, our bodies, our temples, same tabernacle, and we are going to see that even we ourselves are tabernacles, and therefore we have to treat the body a certain way in the same way that they had to treat the tabernacle a certain way. We have to treat the body of Jesus Christ himself a certain way, and in the same way we have to treat the church of Jesus Christ that we are in a certain way. Many of us did not know this, and so we treat the church in, as a country cousin, secondary, Everything else, church lasts to our detriment and many will miss out on heaven because of the things that we did and the disregard that we have for the church of the living God, the church of our Lord Jesus Christ. We are going to put the things in place and we are going to allow for us to see that important place that the church today is supposed to have, a central place, and we then move to fix what we must fix in our lives, in my life, so that we are at the place that God wants us to be. Let us All right, so we are going to take it from Psalm 73. We are going to start our journey through the tabernacle, and we are starting it from the book of Psalms. The question is, why going to a study of the tabernacle to identify the church? And take it from the book of Psalm. Uh, it is important that we understand that the Psalms play a very important role in the tabernacle and the tabernacle life. We will deal with that and touch on that a little bit later. But let us look at Psalm 73. And we go start with verse 3, then we go to verses 12 to 14, and then verse 17. Psalm 73. And the, the writer of this psalm um, wasn't David. We know David wrote most of the psalms, but we have a gentleman, his name was Asaph, and he too was a writer of psalms. And Asaph was struggling in his mind, yes, with the, what he saw happening. He noticed that those that were wicked and, and boastful, they treated the sanctuary in a disrespectful way and 
yet with all of that, they were prosperous and they seemed to be advancing and it troubled him. And he kind of had it, you know, in his mind and until something happened. And then let us see what it says. Psalm 73, verse 3, for I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Yes, and this is what I'm saying. It troubled him. we we'll go to 12 to 14. It troubled him that they were prospering even though they were wicked and vile and they treated with disregard the, the temple, the tabernacle. Then he went on in verse 12. Behold, these are the ungodly who prosper in the world. They increase in riches. Yes, and this is of writing, Verily, I have cleansed my heart in vain and washed my hands in innocence. In other words, here it is that he's living right, he's doing all the, making all the sacrifices, he's doing what God requires of him to do, so keep in line with the requirements of the tabernacle of the sanctuary, and yet it's as if I am doing it all in vain because nothing seemed to be happening to me, and yet the wicked and the boastful who despise the things of the tabernacle, them seem to be prospering and advancing and all of that. And this was the experience that Asaph had. He saw these things and it bothered him. And then now, verse 14, it, it, he's now saying here as he comes down to this particular um, part of the, of the verse. He's saying, for all the day long have I been plagued and chastened every morning then verse 17 you know, kind of sums it up you know as he's saying so much things happen to me so much things happen to the righteous but he summed it up now and then he said until i went into the sanctuary of god now understanding our brethren this is the sanctuary. This is the tabernacle. This is not just saying going into the presence of God. And it, 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 it probably means this. No, he's talking about the sanctuary. And we will show later on that a lot of the psalm has to do with sanctuary life. Has to do with the hymn that they sang. You remember when Jesus was with the disciples and it was the last supper. And the Bible said they sang a hymn. Normally at Passover, there is a hymn that is sung. That is the standard practice from Passover all the way down. There is a particular psalm that they would sing and recite. But it's a, they do it as a hymn. And every Passover, that psalm or those psalms are sung at Passover. At different feasts, they use different psalms at different types of activities they pull for certain psalms as they would go up and at passover they would sing a particular psalm so that the psalm have a whole lot to do with sanctuary life and so here asaph is saying in verse 17 until i went into the sanctuary of god then understood if we are going to understand some things pertaining to spiritual matters, saints of God, we have to understand that it is when we come into the sanctuary that we will understand them. And hence the reason I said that we are going to take this whole matter of the church that we are a part of. Hence the reason I said at the beginning, we are going to look at the church from ground zero coming all the way up. We are going to look at it through the lens of the sanctuary, then like Asaph, I believe we will understand some things and then we will be able to function in a particular way. We will be clearer as to who we are. We will be clearer as to whose we are. We will be clearer as to how to operate in the presence of God because we will see clearer what was God's intention when he set up the sanctuary, the tabernacle, and how a whole lot of things that we believe would have changed today have not changed. His glory 
has not changed. His Shekinah has not changed. The manifestation is different, but the essence of what God is doing is, has not changed. He requires truth in the inward part still. None of those priests could go in and worship God and offer up sacrifice any and any way. They had to conform with a certain lifestyle. Today, you and I are priests of God and we go before his presence and we offer up sacrifice of praise. There are some fundamental things that cannot and will not change and God outlined it in his word and we are going to see it. And so Asaph let us know that it is only when, we, when he went to the sanctuary that he understood their end. It is only as we go through the sanctuary that we are going to understand something saints of God beloved and so we will start with the first sanctuary that was ever erected in the life of the children of Israel and so we know the first sanctuary uh, let us go to Exodus chapter 25 and this is this, the tabernacle uh, that was in the wilderness that Moses himself went up to the mountains and got instructions from God and he was going to having gotten the instructions and having heard from God in the mount he was coming down to put up something you see what happened God Almighty wanted to dwell among them he was going to do it in a different way he was literally coming down and he wanted them to prepare for his coming a particular person was going to be there and the stage had to be set. Everything had to be done to accommodate the occupant of the tabernacle. He was going to reside in the Ark of the Covenant, which was going to be in that tent. And he was going to have to have a certain environment in which he was going to have to function, in which he was going to stay. So God called Moses to come up on the mountain and up there for 40 days and 40 nights. And a whole lot of things happened up there. And while he was there, amongst the things that happened, God gave him and showed him a plan, a pattern, and gave him instructions as to what he was supposed to build, how he was supposed to build it, how he was supposed to do it. In fact, the Bible said that he got even the measurement. This must be three cubits. This must be two this. This must be that. Make sure that you do it or I tell you to do it. Use the dimensions that I give you. In other words, he couldn't just say, boy, him say make a small table, him say two and a half, but the board was short, so we just put a two feet board. No, if God said, make sure, if I tell you two and a half, it's two and a half. If he's on a two foot board, put it one side and find one two and a half. But make sure that you do it the way that I instruct you to do it. God is precise. God is specific. There are some things that cannot change. There are some things that he requires because of who he is, not because of who we are. We cannot say we will, God said, cover it with gold and we run out of gold. So we do part gold and part silver. God said, make sure that what you do is exactly based on the instructions that you have been given. So God was getting ready to come down to dwell among them because ultimately, and we will see that what was in the tabernacle typifies the church because through the church, God is going to dwell with men upon the throne of his father, David, will he sit and rule forever. And so he wanted to rule forever in the kingdom of men, in the midst of the people he was going to be here. And he typified that when he came down to reside in the ark. He wanted to be among men. But he set the pace and gave the instructions for how things ought to be set to accommodate him. Let us turn to Exodus chapter 25 now. And we are looking, 25 and about verse 8. And we are going to be just briefly looking, talking about the, 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 the first sanctuary. So Exodus 25 and verse 8, and let them make me a sanctuary. And this is God now talking and directing his, 
instructions and make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. Right? That's Exodus 25 and verse 8. And then now we turn to Exodus 25 and about verse 40. Because God is giving some instructions and talking to Moses and telling, you know, I, I better set up the tabernacle. I want to dwell among them. And now verse 40 of Exodus 25. And look that thou make them after their pattern which was showed thee in the mount. And as we see that the tabernacle was set up, I won't even show the, go into the images as yet and show, to show the tabernacle because we will do that where once we get to the tabernacle I'm going to show us everything I'm just giving us a little scripture and a little background so that the first sanctuary was that tent that Moses erected right there in the wilderness God wanted to dwell with them and be with them as they were on that wilderness journey and he said look here build me that tabernacle Use the same pattern that I gave to you. And Moses did all that he did and he set up that tabernacle. And having done that, having done that, the, the, it was all there in place until God indicated to him, use the pattern that I gave you. Now when all of that was done and the enclosure was set, it, the outer court, the entire enclosure, it was about 75 feet by 150 feet. 75 feet wide, 150 feet long. And then inside of that enclosure, the tent was put together. And that tent had a holy place and then a most holy place. I'm going to go through that with us. But just to let us know that Moses erected the tent and he followed the pattern that God gave him. Right? And then at the end of it, Exodus chapter uh, 25 and verse 34, I want us to just look at this particular scripture because it happens all the time and it's very significant. And I want us to just read that scripture with me. Exodus chapter 40, sorry, and verse 34. Exodus 40 and verse 34. After Moses had set up that tent and put everything in place based on the pattern that God had given to him, something happened. Exodus 40 and verse 34 tells us that the that, that glory, let's read it together, that then a cloud covered the tent of the congregation and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. So everything was set up, that tent was in place, and when everything was done and the pattern followed and thing done according to the instructions that God gave, after all of that, then the cloud covered the tent and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle, filled the tent. That is the Shekinah presence of God. And that was the first tabernacle, tent, sanctuary that was set up. But later on, as they came out of the wilderness, as, as they settled in the land, and started to live, and their life as a people expanded. A new temple, a new tabernacle, a new sanctuary was about to be built. This one was going to be more permanent. Nevertheless, it was a temple. It was a place where the ark was going to rest and where the presence of God was going to be. So God now allowed Solomon David wanted to do it. God said, not you, David, your hands too bloody. Solomon, your son, is going to do it. So everything was brought together and they built, they erected the second sanctuary. This one was permanent, whereas the one that Moses built was a tent and it moved whenever the people moved. The tent was dismantled, put together, and moved to wherever they were going. Then it was erected again. In this second temple... It was fixed, and it was a magnificent building, and it took years, but it was constructed, it was completed, and all the things were in place. 
Then 2 Chronicles now tells us again, look again at what happened here. 2 Chronicles chapter number 7. And let us read this together. 2 Chronicles chapter 7. 2 Chronicles chapter 7. We're going to read it together. Uh, verses 1 and 2. Now, when Solomon had made an end of praying, this is after the tabernacle was finished. No, it was a dedication of the tabernacle. Solomon had made an end of praying. The fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices. And the glory of the Lord filled the house. Just like in the first tabernacle that Moses did, after they did everything and followed what was to be followed, the glory of the Lord came and filled the place. Similarly, you now this other temple was made, everything in place, the consecration, now they are dedicating it, and in the midst of the dedication, fire came down, and after the offerings were consumed, the glory of the Lord filled the house. And the priest could not enter into the house of the Lord because the glory of the Lord had filled the Lord's house. House. And that is very significant, brethren, because again, God always somehow wants the tabernacle set right and put together and follow a particular pattern. Notice that the glory of the Lord came down and filled the house. And I want us to know, remember this, because we are going to come back to it. Remember this critical point we are going to come back to it. Now, after this tabernacle, after this tabernacle, and I think we are just about coming up to the time, after this tabernacle, which is the second tabernacle, was built, brethren, apostasy set in. Folks started to move away from God. The sanctuary, the tabernacle, which was supposed to be the centerpiece of the life of the people of Israel, was no longer the central focus, the central feature of their lives. And they started to do their own thing. And you know what happened? And it, it will happen in the life of individuals it happens individually, it happens corporately. They drifted, and before long, before long, and I will be, must stop here now, and we pick up next week. I'll stop and then i just make a quick comment. Before long, judgment came. God allowed King Nebuchadnezzar to come in and take the people away captive, carry them to Babylon. But while he came and he did what he was doing and get, he was getting ready to carry them into captivity, Solomon, ah, sorry, King Nebuchadnezzar destroyed that magnificent temple that King Solomon built for God years before. It, in as much as the glory of God filled the house then, the glory departed. Anytime we start to move away from the pattern that God gave, we are going to find that the glory will move and destruction will come. Emptiness, a void, just going through the motion. But no glory, no Shekinah presence. I want us to remember what was just said because we will pick up on it and then we will move now to show that something must be significant about the tabernacle. It was a tent that had to be moved about. Then after the tent, a magnificent building. But then the building was destroyed. But then they built a third temple and then that went into ruin. And then they built a fourth one. Well, not really a fourth one, but they had to remodel and expand. 
that other temple which we read about in the New Testament under King Herod, that temple that Jesus was in when he was here, it was that third temple remodeled and expanded. Herod did that for 46 years. That's why Jesus said, destroy this temple and in three days I'll raise up and they laugh at him and say, how can you raise up? 40 and 6 years was this in. That was the third temple that Herod and all those before him was working on and getting to that stage. But every step of the way, we see when the temple is up and working right, the Shekinah presence of God come down. And we are going to see as we go on that the same thing happened in the life of Jesus, who was a temple. In our lives, we are temples. And in the life of the church, that in the church, the Shekinah presence of God is here. But we will go into that. But just to stop now and just take time, brothers and sisters, and rehearse the things that were said today. Very important because when we pick up next week, I don't want us to pick up. We just, just for, especially if anybody missed out today, we pick up next week and you just take it from there. You're not going to get it. You have to get it from the beginning. So we're going to pick up from here and we're going to continue with the temples that were built. And then we are going to move now to show what the temple signifies, what the tabernacle signifies or symbolizes or represents. And then we are going to put the pieces together. And we will show at the end of this presentation, this Bible study series, that how many of us were taking things in the church is a joke. We have been underperforming. We have been treating the thing mediocre and this will enlighten all of our eyes and propel us to walk godly, to take this thing seriously because the God who was the God of the first sanctuary back there in Exodus is the same God who is the God of this sanctuary which the church prefigured or which prefigured the church which church is now here and we need to treat this church of God, this church of the Lord Jesus Christ, in a particular way. God bless you as we close tonight. And God's willing, next week, same time, we pick up and we continue with the church under the broader team, earnestly contend. God bless you in Jesus' name. Let us pray. Father, we bless your great name. We thank you, mighty God, for another privilege, another time to go into Bible study. Touch our hearts, touch our minds. Help us, mighty God, to see who we are, whose we are, and to see where we are in the church of the living God. Direct our minds, direct our hearts. Help us to live the way you want us to live. Help us to recognize that you are the same God who was the God of the tabernacle back there in the wilderness, and your your goodness and your greatness and the fear of the Lord must still be in the hearts of men because you are still the almighty and the sovereign God. Have your own way. Teach us, mighty God, and let your name be glorified. Bless your people abundantly. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Amen. God richly bless you. Thanks again for being in Bible study. God's willing next week, same time. We pick up and we continue on this Bible study series. God bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.